Originally, uh, our next presenter had hoped to be here in person. Unfortunately, there were some late breaking events, which meant that he was not able to join us in person today. But thankfully, uh, we are very grateful that he is able to accommodate the symposium and be able to join us on Zoom. Uh, it's going to continue the same format that we have used, uh, just that it is absolutely essential uh, when we uh, reach the Q&A portion, uh, you must use the microphone. Otherwise, uh, our presenter will not be able to hear you. Um, so uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Eric Bubar, who is currently the founding professor of engineering at the Marymount University School of Science, Mathematics and Engineering. He holds a PhD in applied physics from Clemson University and manages a hands-on research makerspace, uh, creating a list of technologies that combine game design, hobbyist microcontrollers, and 3D printing and design. Most recently, he has begun exploring how machine learning and AI coupled with OpenCV can be used to create a system for gamification and monitoring of in-home rehabilitation exercise sessions to improve adherence to prescribed programs in collaboration with the Marymount Research Center for Optimal Aging. Please welcome Dr. Eric Bubar. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, brilliant, brilliant man wrote that. I wrote that this morning. Um, so uh, the official talk is use of machine learning and AI human post tracking unity and open source motion capture for synthetic data creation for interactive experiences. And here's the nice official slide, uh, official um, uh, name, uh, Eric Bubar from Marymount University School of Science, Math and, and, and Engineering. Um, this is to take a picture so I can share this on social media uh, and then we can get to the actual stuff that I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm just playing with AI mocap and VR. Um, this is a way I justify getting new toys for myself and for my lab so I can turn myself into Iron Man or, or the Mandalorian, uh, either in reality or in virtual reality. Um, so my PhD is in applied physics uh, and our engineering program is brand new, started just last year. Uh, and I'm using something I, uh, I kind of call maker nearing. So maker engineering using maker technologies to just make cool stuff. Uh, that's that's really what I'm trying to do. Uh, and this talk is about uh, work I've been doing for about about a year now uh, in learning about AI and machine learning uh, and, and something called open computer vision, which I didn't even know what that was un until about a year ago. So the very long, long abstract, uh, what I'm talking about with human pose recognition is, is a variety of different frameworks to let you kind of identify key points uh, like shoulders, hands, faces uh, on the human body. Uh, and this has probably been a long standing uh, problem in computer vision to, to use computers to recognize people. Uh, and there's lots of different ways you can do this. Uh, open pose, pose net, blaze pose. I'll talk about a few of those. Um, and they've, they've reached the sufficient uh, ease of use now uh, that somebody with basic coding knowledge uh, can actually use this uh, kind of tool to track somebody uh, pretty easily uh, using just a webcam or even just a mobile phone. Uh, just my, my cell phone will work just fine for that. Uh, and this opens up a variety of possibilities uh, for kind of making immersive XR experiences. So not just VR, but AR, uh, what kind of uh, interaction you want to do with the computer, you can do very naturally uh, with, with human pose recognition. Um, in the biomedical engineering department at Marymount, uh, we work with a lot of the healthcare faculty in our uh, healthcare programs, uh, and they basically tell me what they need, and I try to make it something in reality. Uh, and a lot of that involves uh, exercise rehab. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is a Python-based implementation of Google's Media Pipe framework. Uh, I'll talk about what that is uh, and how we use that to play Tetris and Pac-Man. Uh, I'll demonstrate how we use that for um, some Rococo video mocap analysis uh, to try to improve uh, exercise recognition. Uh, and I'll toss some Blender into there too. Uh, and then I'll talk very, very briefly about how we're going to uh, try to use Unity uh, the physics game engine for, for maybe more complex game experience development. So uh, what is the too long didn't read version of that? Uh, I don't know if anybody knows who this is, uh, this lady over here on the right. This is the Skyrim grandma. Uh, this is uh, an older lady who's, who's become very popular on YouTube and Twitch for playing Skyrim. 
So, so this made me think, hey, older people, um, maybe they like video games too, and we can use that to keep them exercising uh, and moving, uh, which as my uh, healthcare colleagues tell me is the most important thing to kind of uh, stay healthy uh, is to just exercise and move. Uh, so along those lines, what I'm gonna do is talk about um, what is Google Media Pipe and Blaze Pose and how am I using that to provide at-home uh, feedback for exercise programs? Uh, and how can I gamify this to make it fun for, for ladies like uh, Shirley, the uh, Skyrim granny? Uh, and can I use it to actually make some anonymized synthet synthetic data uh, so that um, unlike my healthcare colleagues, I like sitting in the basement and not having to work with people. So can I work with synthetic people instead and not have to interact with anybody? Uh, and then I, I said something about Unity. So, so let's toss a little bit about in, uh, Unity in there at the very end. So uh, open computer vision uh, uh, pose estimation, what is that? Uh, it's just using a webcam uh, and that webcam can find key points on a human body. So key points would be things like uh, shoulders, hips, knees, feet, hands, uh, and usually some points on the face. Uh, different systems have different numbers of key points. Uh, a lot of them were based on, um, I believe something called COCO, uh, common Objects and Context Database. Uh, I think from um, Microsoft, I think sponsored a bunch of contests uh, involving COCO uh, to identify just these key points from human, human from the human body. Uh, I've looked at PoseNet, YOLO, V7, Open Pose, a media pipe Blaze Pose. It played with a all of them a little bit for, for a couple of months, uh, about a year ago. And I, I kind of centered on uh, media pipe Blaze Pose. So what I found was uh, it had very high speed uh, with low processing power. So I can make this work on just a cell phone. Uh, and it's mobile phone ready, uh, web ready. Uh, and it had lots of samples on Python and lots of YouTubers that I could follow along their videos and just repeat what they did and learn how to do it uh, very quickly. Uh, so that documentation made it much, much easier for me to implement and start uh, flying along and using uh, this media pipe blaze pose. So I've continued along with Blaze Pose uh, and developed some stuff. So why do I like Blaze Pose? Uh, because it, it, it's uh, very, very quick. So what's the machine learning that's going on here? Uh, as I understand, it's a convolutional neural network. It was trained on about 30,000 hand annotated images of people uh, that were using a mobile phone AR app. So it's made mobile pictures, mobile phone uh, photos, uh, taken in lots of real world conditions. Uh, and then about 85,000 training images of people in a variety of fitness poses. Uh, the focus of this really is not for human life critical applications. Uh, it, it has an entertainment focus. So I like that too, because I like entertainment. I don't, I don't like anything too real. Um, the images that they use are from diverse demographics and diverse geographic regions. Uh, and they've tried to be uh, cognizant of that. Uh, and what it does uh, that I think is really, really quite neat, uh, it provides normalized X, Y uh, positions uh, inside of an image and calculated Z values. So it provides some estimate of depth uh, based on um, something called GUM, uh, articulated uh, 3D human shape models. So you're getting a kind of uh, a 3D position from a two-dimensional camera, from just a 2D camera. So you don't need to connect, you don't need a depth sensor, um, you don't need two cameras, it's just one, one camera. Uh, the results that you get out of this is a 33 by 5 tensor. Uh, that's the screen projected X, Y, and Z key points, uh, a percentage of visibility of a key point, uh, and a presence uh, percentage of that key point. Um, so if you start including key points, then, then it will tell you this. Uh, so all very useful information for doing your fitness tracking. Uh, and you can see over here, um, you've got lots of uh, high speed uh, tracking of things, but you can notice some things about these these images. Uh, they're kind of optimally positioned. So, so that's something I've uh, experienced as I've been using this. Um, it doesn't work in all conditions. So I found uh, Blaze Pose very easy to implement uh, with a Python, uh, just a Jupyter notebook. Uh, and the nice thing, and the reason that it works really, really quickly, uh, is the first thing it does is it kind of finds a face. Face has lots of distinct features on it, so it's very easy, uh, a little bit easier for um, a computer to recognize a face. Once it does that, it tracks out a um, basic um, region for the face, and then extrapolates out where's the body 
pieces. Where are the body key points going to be found uh, based on uh, the Vitruvian Man uh, from Da Vinci? Uh, and then finds these key points. And then the way it gets its speed is it doesn't do that every single time. Once it finds those key points, it then extrapolates uh, where the net future key points are. It estimates those positions based on the previous positions. So it's not finding all the key points every time. It's finding the key points usually once. And as long as it can retain those key points, it's then finding the future key points based on the prior key points. So that saves a lot of computational resources and gives it really, really good performance in really, really, really low resources. Uh, so it works on, on like a Pixel 3 cell phone. Um, so very, very useful. So you can see that kind of mapped out here. Uh, first frame, it does the pose detection uh, and tracks the pose. And then on future frames, it doesn't do that pose detection again. And what it does, it uh, tracks, uh, I believe it's 33 different key points uh, and tracks those in real time. Uh, and I found it to have really, really good performance uh, uh, in most situations. So what I could do is I was able to uh, implement it. Let's uh, make place pose start working, track somebody's key points, uh, and let's see if we can use that to control a video game uh, that we can implement in Pygame. So this is all implemented within Python. Uh, there's a QR code there that you can scan, and this will take you to the GitHub uh, that gives you very, very easy basic instructions on how to install uh, basically Anaconda, uh, get a Jupyter Notebook up and running, download the Jupyter Notebook and the uh, files that we use here. Uh, I think there's some MP3s, so you can actually get that sweet, sweet Tetris music. Uh, and then you can control Tetris uh, using using just your body. So we'll play a clip of this right here. I stripped out all the sound, so you get my narration instead. Uh, so there's a nice close-up view. Here I am exercising in a hotel room. So this is... Um, Using Blaze Pose, it's identifying those key points for me. You can see tracking isn't perfect. It kind of loses some tracking uh, based on contrast of color here. But as I lift my left and uh, right legs up, that controls the pieces moving left and right. As I rotate my uh, shoulder abduction, arms up and down, it rotates the pieces. And then as I squat, it controls the pieces going down. So you can use this to control and play a full game of Tetris. Uh, actually work up quite a quite a sweat doing this. Um, maybe I should be ashamed to admit that, but it, it, it's a pretty good workout. Um, uh, this is set up for balancing uh, to try to help people learn how to balance better. Um, but we could put any kind of exercise pose that we want into this. And right now, this is all based on conditional statements. So this is just if and then. If the angle of my knee is some certain threshold, then it's going to uh, trigger, hey, my knee's up, uh, and let's move the piece left or right, respectively. And we could do this with other video games, too. It doesn't just have to be Tetris. So we've done the same thing. Same QR code uh, will get you into uh, Pac-Man. So we can play Pac-Man with this as well. Slightly different uh, exercise poses that we've implemented here. Uh, but again, it's all written with Pygame. Uh, and written in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I'm going to control left and right movement with shoulder abduction again. I'm going to control going up with shoulder flexion, so lifting my shoulder up. And I'm going to control downward movement with squats. So you can see Pac-Man responding. I squat down, get that wonderful power peg, and let's go hunt down those ghosts. Um, we could do some optimization. Uh, these games were all written. Initially, I wrote them uh, myself. Uh, in about a, a weekend using some YouTube tutorials and tossed the uh, media pipe control on top of that, uh, and then had some students uh, repeat the work to make sure it's doable by others, uh, by some undergraduates uh, in the span of a uh, two six-week uh, summer programs that students did this. So this is a uh, student work as well. Uh, and again, this is all controlled with conditional statements. Uh, and what we want to do is see if we can uh, enhance this, maybe improve it, improve how fast it's working uh, to uh, kind of improve these games and start programming some more games uh, to make this more interesting as a kind of um, interactive framework. Uh, but what happens when you have non-optimal positioning? So, so I mentioned Blaze Pose is great, uh, but it does fail in some places. It works great when I'm moving parallel to the camera, but then when I start moving forwards and backwards, uh, it's it's not so great. 
Uh, it starts to lose accuracy when you're occluding limbs or when lighting isn't ideal, as you saw in those videos in the hotel room, uh, when colors aren't distinct. So when the colors of my socks were blue and the floor is blue, it can't track my feet. So this is troublesome. We need to figure out how to fix that. Uh, and we need also need to assess accuracy of this. How good is this uh, system actually for, for clinicians to use? Uh, so we did a little bit of that. We used goniometry, so these fancy protractor kind of thing to measure angles of joints on the body. Uh, I had students do this when I was doing various different motions and compare this to what uh, Blaze Post was giving for those same angles. We get joint angles that were about 10 to 15 degrees um, um, in, in accuracy and precision uh, from, from media pipe, uh, from Blaze Pose, uh, when we compare it to goniometry. And oddly enough, uh, I found this is actually what clinicians measure too. Clinicians are about 10 to 15 degrees accurate. So we are getting accuracy of clinicians. I presented this to some clinician conferences and, and told them this like, oh, this is exciting. You can, you can use this for, for, for clinical purposes too for a little bit. Uh, they were not impressed. So uh, what this convinced me we need to do, we need to rebuild it. We have the technology, we can make it better than it was, make it better, stronger, and faster. So how do we do that? This is where Spider-Man comes into play. Uh, so what I've done is let's let's train on synthetic humans. Uh, and the nice part about this is this this takes away the problem to anonymize data. So this video that you're about to see, this is actually me dancing. Uh, and then I used Rococo, a motion capture um, tool uh, that you can use online to apply my movement uh, data onto a synthetic human. Uh, and if I'm going to pick a synthetic human, I use uh, Spider-Man, my favorite superhero. So here's my sweet, sweet dance moves uh, popped onto Spider-Man uh, and tracking this with uh, media pipe blaze bows. So I am tracking my movement. Uh, and what I can do with this is I got this camera view from just one perspective. Uh, this was the camera right in front of me. But now I can use mocap and toss it into Blender and I can control this camera now. And I can rotate it around, get it from all angles. So I can make this more um, robust to different angles of tracking my, my sweet, sweet dancing. Uh, I can change the background here. Uh, I can uh, manually pick the um, key points and just make the machine learning uh, more robust to tracking these positions. And then I can also not just use conditional statements to recognize a movement. I can actually use uh, machine learning to recognize it. I can use all of this data combined, stack it up over time, uh, and I can I can uh, make a machine learning model that where I can recognize this uh, this uh, movement uh, instead of conditionals. So this makes it a little bit more robust, uh, maybe. So let's see what we get with this. What can we do with this conditional tracking? Uh, and machine learning. So overall, our goal is to create in-home rehab exercise feedback, where users can get real-time feedback on exercise and make it fun for them. Uh, and one of the exercise programs that's very popular for falls prevention uh, for Marymount uh, um, faculty is the Otago exercise program. So what I did is I used machine learning instead of conditional statements uh, to recognize these exercises. So this right here, similar system uh, using blaze pose, except now it's recognizing these uh, exercise poses with certain probabilities. Uh, and one of the big challenges was this, this calf raise that you see, uh, and these left side hip and right side hip uh, uh, being uh, motions. Those were very hard to program in with conditionals. Conditionals weren't very robust for recognizing this uh, and kind of had trouble picking these exercises. Once I started using machine learning to kind of train it, though, I could recognize very, very small movements uh, of those calf raises to, to actually detect these, these, these movements uh, and get kind of more robust tracking of this Otago exercise tracking. So what I need to do now is I need to make this more fun. Right, this is kind of, I think this is boring. Um, so how do I make it more fun? How do I gamify it more and make a more robust game? Uh, so that's, that's what we're gonna start working on in the, in the lab uh, moving forward. And other things that my students are working on, uh, we wanna dynamically calculate and predict uh, what's called the margin of stability 
for falls detection and prevention. Uh, so that's, can we extrapolate if somebody is going to fall and detect that uh, with just one camera watching them? Uh, and can we anonymize it by just detecting not the, the person and the picture frame, uh, just their skeleton, uh, just those 33 key points. Uh, we also want to do some comparing of performance of conditional versus machine learning models for exercise recognition uh, and figure out why is it so much better um, and, and when can we use conditionals which maybe are a little bit quicker uh, versus when do we need to use the machine learning model and train the machine learning model. Uh, and then we want to do more complex game design experiences. Uh, what I'd really like to do is, uh, is make an, uh, I call it EXR arcade, uh, X arcade. Uh, so I want to do a suite of classic arcade games that you can play in AR with uh, body movements uh, with real-time feedback and ideally have an interface for a clinician or somebody that wants to use it, they can plug in their own exercises. So maybe they don't want to control Pac-Man with squats. They want to control it with jumping jacks or something. Uh, can we program that in so that they can do that uh, and make, make exercise fun and interesting for people? And can we make it easy enough that somebody can do uh, at home? So uh, this is a problem with, with things like Wii or Kinect um, or even a Nintendo Switch. It can be hard to set up those sensors, uh, particularly for uh, non-gaming kinds of people that might want to try it, uh, but don't want to deal with the struggles of, of setting up that kind of system. Um, so where's the future going? Um, where do we go P beyond Python? Uh, you, can, you can see my, my uh, terrified face over here in the corner where I am actually using uh, Blaze Post to read in feedback, uh, to read in all this uh, data, all the key point data, and then using a socket communication to send that data from Python into Unity. Uh, and then I'm gathering that data in Unity. Uh, it's all popping up down here uh, in, in my uh, console. Uh, and then I can use that to do all sorts of complex video game development, right? I can move into 3D games, something more complicated than Pygame. Uh, I can use what I know in Unity and not have to teach myself all the structures of Pygame. Um, so what I've what I've done here is I can actually control a virtual character moving around in this virtual world um, on something like uh, MetaQuest Pro. I just got this. This is so exciting. And then now I hear that they're going to discontinue the thing, of course. So if you want a product to be discontinued, just tell me to buy it uh, and, and they'll get rid of it. Um, so I can control my virtual character in my headset walking around. Uh, I can start walking just very naturally, uh, and the character will walk naturally uh, by machine learning, recognizing I'm walking versus when I'm running, and I can walk and run in, in real time in this virtual world uh, and very natural reactions. Um, I don't need to use controllers. Uh, older individuals uh, that I've worked with have trouble using the controllers. Uh, my, my mother, who has Parkinson's, has trouble using controllers, but I force her to play her video games. I force her to play Beat Saber. So if she can play Beat Saber without controllers, uh, that can kind of uh, help ease uh, the struggle with setting up the technology to, to actually use those games. Uh, and what we're finding uh, increasingly, at least anecdotally, is a lot of these VR games uh, are helping uh, patients with Parkinson's to kind of mitigate uh, impacts from their tremors. So um, apparently Beat Saber gives her good exercise, gives her good um, kind of uh, having to exercise her brain and think about how to dodge these blocks and move around a little bit uh, and kind of challenging the brain in that way with this virtual reality interaction um, kind of mitigates her tremors, uh, which is nice and very useful, but we need to make that easier and more intuitive for people to do. So if we can do that with this uh, AR camera, kind of tracking your movement instead of requiring controllers and complex setup, uh, then great. Uh, so our goal here is really to make Wii and Connect without the hard uh, difficulties of setup um, and try to make it all work with just a webcam or maybe just a cell phone camera. Uh, so it's super, super accessible for anybody. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm working on. That's the uh, AR kind of stuff I'm doing uh, over the past year. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has and really want to thank uh, the symposium and the organizers for inviting me and setting this up for me at the last minute. Um, I taught a summer class for a bunch of high school students in exchange for all of my wonderful efforts to give them 
knowledge in engineering, they gave me COVID for the first time. So I'm hiding at home. All right, uh, so let's uh, first thank uh, Dr. Eric Bubar. Um, and of course, we wish you a uh, swift and comfortable recovery. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, come up and use the mic. Um, or we also do have a, a, a hand mic if you need us to come to you. Um, hi, so I know, I know you are doing like uh, machine learning and AI, but um, that seems to be a, perhaps it could be tied to a level of hardware that maybe isn't available for consumers. A lot of consumers seem to have like laptop levels of like webcams and those aren't really HD by default unless you get the higher end models. What kind of webcam do you think would be optimal or would be best for this kind of system if it's machine learning? Uh, so the the HD camera is best, but uh, the videos that you were seeing, that was just a, a basic webcam that's on my own laptop. So I am trying to make sure that I develop it with a basic webcam in mind, just the basic thing that comes on a standard laptop. So to improve it, uh, yeah, for ideal performance, you want a, a HD webcam, but... Um, Try to make it work with a non HD. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. It's a big focus. Good consumer hardware. Cheap, easily accessible. All right. Any other questions? No? All right. Uh, thank you again. And I uh, hope you have, a, again, a, a swift and comfortable recovery. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Eric Bubar. Thank you so much. <laughs>